the film. It's a story of a man who appreciates this new solitude that he has because for him, I think it gives him a freedom. It's a freedom from oppression, basically, a form of oppression and the question of human connection and does everybody need it in some form. It takes place in a post-apocalyptic world. The first 15 minutes of the film, there's no dialogue at all and it's just one character and then somebody else shows up to disrupt the, the peace and solitude of this world. I just love the fact that not everything was explained and so what that kind of freedom gives to me is that I don't have to make it a movie about the how and why and I can make it a movie more about the emotional connection between people which is at the end of the world I think all that really matters anyway. I knew you were supposed to be here. It was just supposed to be me. I think what's interesting about the first 15 minutes is that you're seeing the world the way he sees it. We had this incredible opportunity to sort of find a way to communicate what a lack of sound might sound like. We wanted the houses to have a certain, you know, kind of be a character, have a certain sound so that you would hear what life used to be like. We were trying to communicate what's going on in our lead character's head, and in our head, we don't necessarily hear nothing. You know, production sound has to be cleaned up meticulously, non-human sounds, no electricity, no planes, no cars, just nature. And our main character who moves things around, drives around, all those sounds are enhanced. When I was a cinematographer, I really only cared about the image, and sometimes I would have a bad reaction to something I shot, and I would pinpoint later that from an audio perspective, it wasn't living up to what I had imagined in my mind. What you're seeing, it feels almost one dimensional, but the sound can feel all around you and, in, and totally immerse you and like push you into the image. For independent film and for lower budget film, I think sound is, first of all, an amazing way to elevate the feeling and the scope of your film and to create a bigger palette than you might have had the money to afford. I use a lot of sounds that come from Tony. I also use sounds for myself, but we communicate with Tony throughout. He always has ideas of elements to add to it that are unexpected that we didn't think of. He also takes what I've done and puts it into a theater with so many more speakers. And in this case, you know, an Atmos mix. So. He takes it to a completely, completely different level. I don't know what I was doing when it happened. You keep your town nice and clean, and we do that with our people. Take, it with you. Take your hand off the wheel. I feel so sad for you. There's no before. There's only from now on. I can't say enough about Dolby Atmos. This is the first time doing it, but it's, it's, uh, I would wish I could mix every film in Dolby Atmos. The Dolby Atmos, I mean, the first moment that I sat in the room, it's like not just watching a film, but you're in the film. Being able to pull sounds around you and separate them and create a much bigger sound field is a huge asset. It becomes a three-dimensional sound world. You can create space with the sound. So it gives you so much more opportunity, and of course, then there's more responsibility, too. Even on a film like this, it still can take full advantage of the Dolby Atmos by immersing you in those environments. We have the ability to put those sounds everywhere where people least expect it. You almost feel like there's people behind you and above you, and it gives you so many more possibilities with how you can emotionally sort of affect the audience. Civilization. I've been doing it for the past two. You know, there was something about the way she looked.